नमो विष्णु बुदाय कृष्ण पृष्ठा भूतले श्रीमाते भक्तिवेदात स्वामी नम नमस्ते सरस्वते देवी गौरवाणी विचारिणे निवसेशन्यवारी पश्चिदेश ज्ञानतिमंडस्यानंजनाशलाखा चक्षुन्मलिताेन तस्म श्रीगुरव नम श्री चैतन्य मनो वैष्णो स्थाता भूतले स्वयं ददाटे स्वापदिक नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय हरे कृष्णा So today we're continuing the reading from Canto Nine, Chapter Six. I believe text forty-one onwards. Is that correct? Which verse is on the board? Pardon? Forty-six. Okay. Forty-five or just forty-six? Just forty-six. <coughs> the downfall of Sarbhari Muni. We'll just read the previous verses, starting at forty-one, and come to today, today's verse. Can you hear at the back? That's the question. Maharaj, can you hear? Because for a few days it was a little hard to hear. It's good. Okay. Savincha, savincha, priyam, srinam, jarato ham, asan mata, bali palita ejatka, ityang patyuda hita. Sadhai shet datmanam. Translation 41:42. So Bari Muni thought, hmm, I am now feeble because of old age. My hair has become grey. My skin. Is slack, and my head always trembles. Besides, I am a yogi. Therefore, women do not like me. Since the king has thus rejected me, I shall reform my body in such a way as to be desirable, even to. Celestial women, what to speak of the daughters of worldly kings? Next verse. Muni praveshi takshatra kanyam tu tu puram vidhi mat vitaksa raja kanyabir. Thereafter, when Sho, when Sobhari Muni became quite a young and beautiful person, the messenger of the palace took him inside the residential quarters of the princesses, which were extremely opulent. 
all fifty princesses then accepted him as their husband although he was only one man ta sang kalir abut bu yangs tad arte po yasoridam mamanu rupo nayang va iti tad gata chetasam Thereafter, the princesses, being attracted by Sobhari Muni, gave up their sisterly relationships and quarreled among themselves, each one of them contending, This man is just suitable for me and not for you. In this way, there ensued a great disagreement. Sabahav chastabe aparaniya tapakshiyanarya parichadeshu kviheshunano pavanamalamba sarasuso gandika kananeshu. Today's verse, please repeat. Mahara Shayasana Vastra Bhushana Snana I'll go for the word for word here because it's a very quite a long word. Anulepa Abhyavahara Malyakai Su Alankrita Stri Purusheshu Nityada Reme Anugayat Dvija Bringa Vandishu Maharashayasana Vastrabhushana Maha Arha Very costly Shaya, Shaya. Bedding. bedding, asana, asana. Sitting, places. sitting places, vastra, vastra. clothing, clothing. Bhushana. Bhushana, ornaments, ornaments. Snana. Snana. Snana, bathing places, bathing places. Anulepa. Anulepa, sandalwood, Sandal abhyavahara, palatable dishes, Malyakai and with garlands Su Alankrita properly dressed and decorated Stri women Purusheshu with men also Nityada constantly Reme enjoyed Anugayat followed by the singing of Vija, birds, bringa, bumblebees, vandishu, and professional singers. Translation and purport by His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. Because Saubhari Muni was expert in chanting mantras perfectly, his Severe austerities resulted in an opulent home with garments, ornaments, properly dressed and decorated maidservants and manservants, and varieties of parks with clear water, lakes, and gardens. In the gardens, fragrant with varieties of 
flowers, birds chirped, and bees hummed. Surrounded by professional singers, so Bhari Muni's home was amply provided with valuable beds, seats, ornaments, and arrangements for bathing, and there were varieties of sandalwood creams, flower garlands, and palatable dishes. Thus surrounded by opulent paraphernalia, the Muni engaged in family affairs with his numerous wives. <laughs> Purport. <clears throat> so Bari Rishi was a great yogi. Yogic perfection makes available eight material opulences. Anima, Lagima, Mahima, Prapti, Prakamya, Ishitva, Ash Ashitva, and Kamavasayitva, Sayita. So Bari Muni exhibited super excellence in material enjoyment by dint of his yogic perfection. The word Bhavricha means expert in chanting mantras. As material opulence can be achieved by ordinary material means, it can also be achieved by subtle means through mantras. By chanting mantras, so Bari Muni arranged for material opulence. But this was not perfection in life. As will be seen, so Bari Muni became very dissatisfied with material opulence and thus, thus left everything and re-entered the forest in the Vanaprastha order and achieved final success. Those who are not Atma Tattvavit, who do not know the spiritual value of life, can be satisfied with external material opulences. But those who are Atma Tattvavit are not inspired by material opulence. This is the instruction we can derive from the life and activities of Sobhari Muni. End of purport. This is like a, a dream, a, the, the most amazing dream that anyone could imagine in the material world. And if there was such a yogi present today, he would be very popular. Somehow or another, as we've been, we heard maybe yesterday, how most people are aspiring, even in the name of spiritual life, particularly human life, to increase their sense gratification unendingly, and with the hope that my happiness will increase unendingly. But that's the, as Prabhupada mentions clearly here, is not the goal or the perfection of human life. Kamasya nendriya pratiya labo jiveti havata jivasya tadva jignas nata yascaya karma bihi. The human life is not meant for sense gratification. It is meant for inquiring into the nature of the absolute truth. That should be the goal of our works. We may work. But the goal of our work is to inquire into the nature of the absolute truth. But here we see a great yogi. We've already heard, due to his offenses towards Garuda, he fell from his yogic position, became attached. He was attached to the fishes in his section of the Yamuna River. And thus he cursed Garuda. And then, because of that, Vaishnava Aparad, he fell from his position of yogic trance. He was quite advanced, but still he fell. Such is the danger of not taking shelter of the lotus feet of Krishna. We may fall at any moment. The risk of committing offenses to the Vaishnavas, or other forms of causes of fall down, are always there. One has to be on guard in all, all stages. Then he became attracted to the copulating fish and consequently 
he became again attracted to the idea of sensual pleasures of this world. Leaving the water, he approached the king, Mandata, requesting, please give me one of your daughters in marriage. But the king tactfully deferred the decision, come back tomorrow, I will leave it up to my daughters whether they wish to accept or not. They can choose. He realized that his position was not very hopeful. Old, hair gray, skin wrinkled, teeth maybe still there, but maybe not. I went to the dentist just now in Mumbai. He said, have you got any problem with your teeth? I said, no. Well, that's good. I said, I haven't got any. <laughs> I've got one or two root canals, and that's about it. The rest are all plastic or something. The whole material body, in one sense, is like that. But his body looked pretty ugly, emaciated. You know, he'd been in the water for quite a long time. He was a yogi. If we go in the water for a few minutes, we probably won't come out. At least we won't come out alive. But he'd been there a long time because he was controlling his breathing. It's pretty hard to breathe underwater. If you're a fish, it's pretty easy. But for humans, it's not. So, he, but he was controlling his breathing, so he didn't have to worry. So looking at his own physical form, after all, in this material world, the tendency is to be attracted to physical forms. He wasn't very attractive, at least not to the daughters of King Mandata. So he realized in that condition, he's hardly likely to get a beautiful young damsel. And he wasn't rich, physically, materially speaking. He had mystic powers, but he didn't have a lot of wealth. Young girls often marry 80-year-old men if they're rich or famous because they think that they can then Maybe he'll die pretty soon, and I will inherit all the riches. Very nice. But that wasn't the case here. He didn't have a house. He didn't have a car. He didn't have any material facilities, per se. And he was ugly. We see this in old age, and generally speaking in old age, although people, they try to, nowadays particularly, there's a great endeavor, much of the pharmaceutical business, the science, is geared towards trying to perpetuate this illusion of trying to enjoy in this body, even in old age. I was glancing at a well, <laughs> Jayad Vaitamarj. He's very expert at writing these kind of cutting articles. And he was, when he was the editor of BTG, he wrote one article about the fallacy of old age. It was, a, it, it, it was an, an editorial, it wasn't an article, it was just a short editorial. And he was in New Orleans and he saw a sign on the wall and it said, eat well, stay fit and die anyway. <laughs> Whether we're fit or not fit, whatever we are, we're going to die. One of my close devotee friends from 30 years ago, I don't see him now, but he was a wonderful devotee from Australia named Brahmananda Prabhu. Some of the devotees from Australia will remember him. He was a big Sankirtan, as we used to call it, Sankirtan, selling paintings. He was a big collector, and uh, then he became a health specialist, and he was a big health specialist in <laughs> Malaysia. Even to the Sultan, he was the health consultant for the Sultan of Silangor, and he had very well to do. He was quite well to do. He had a beautiful wife, a nice kid, and this and that. Living a nice way in Malaysia. 52 years old, he just died last week. Pop. He's got all the answers, but still can't even protect ourselves. Death comes when it comes, no matter what. Keep fit. Whatever we do, have a big house. Whatever we've got, nothing can protect us. People in this world think we can be protected. They're taking shelter of these falsities. Atmasanyas for such for 
Deha Kala Tradita Kala Tradishu Atmasanya Swasat Sapi. This is the illusion. People who are devoid of Atmatattva do not inquire into the real uh, problems of life, being too much absorbed in family life, in material opulence, etc. They do not see their in inevitable death. This is the greatest, uh, you could say, disaster in one sense. The greatest shame in society. With all of our modern facilities, we're spending it to try to make ourselves look young again. We're 70 years old and people are willing to spend a hundred thousand or more dollars or more just to try to make themselves a little more pretty so that perhaps they can again enjoy. Get married, I'm only 80 years old. Only 80 years old. Because it sometimes happens. Try to enjoy again. Ch children in their 70s. The, the itch never goes away. Eh? Unless we have that higher taste, unless we take shelter of the lotus feet of Krishna, unless we chant the holy names, become absorbed in hearing and chanting about Krishna, the tendency will be there. They will be attracted to the material energy. Even in old age, when Prabhupada was in Paris, he noted 80-year-old men going to the strip tease clubs to try to enjoy the naked forms. It doesn't go away. It's a, the greatest shame in society, the old people. So Bari Muni is teaching us here as well that even in, you know, in advanced condition spiritually as well as physically he became again attracted and wanted to enjoy young girls so he took on a beautiful form incredibly beautiful even Mandata was envious of his son-in-law who had such opulence it exceeded that of the heavenly planets he was a powerful yogi he was expert at chanting mantras very austere he had a lot of shakti so he could create all these things, but what a waste. What a waste of such opportunity, you could say. But he's teaching a lesson. Because this happens over and over again in the material world. For whatever reason, a person attains some good karma and then they waste the opportunity and fall down again. So he also fell into illusion, but he came to his senses. You know, he didn't lose it because he previously <coughs> he was practicing spiritual life and he'd taken shelter of the Yamuna River so he had some mercy and uh, he took up again spiritual life he took up the Vanaprastha order as we've just heard and with his wives he went to the forest and practiced spirituality another lesson he's teaching here is that you know he's thinking well 50 wives that's pretty good most men would be very happy if they were able to to have 50 or more wives if they could do it and enjoy like anything maybe the wives would not be so happy and in this case they were not so happy there were 50 of them was, if we think of it Krishna had 16,108 wives in Dwarka now if you work that out one wife would have one night every 50 years with her husband wouldn't be very satisfying you'd probably be too old by the time your time came around be pretty miserable waiting waiting I mean it, it's pretty miserable situation of course Krishna is not an ordinary man this is proof that he's God people say he's a licentious person he's got so many wives they don't read the rest of it that he expanded himself 16,108 times to be with each wife this is God but ordinary people like Shobari Muni maybe expanded himself eight times maximum but they're all identical they can't act independently of each other bit boring also so whatever it is it's a material achievement even when we're chanting the holy names of Krishna we may be pronouncing we may be a Sanskritist or whatever but if we're still committing our parat, the result of our chanting may be not what it's supposed to be we may have to learn a few lessons like Sobari Moon is teaching us you fall into a little bit of Maya we may get material results unless we come seriously endeavor at least to come to pure chanting of the mantra 
Being really expert in chanting is pure chanting. Chanting with love, Prabhupada said. He said to chant with loving affection. We heard yesterday in the Dhammadarastakam that this mood of loving affection, we can't enter into these pastimes as long as we have awe and reverential mood. But the process of Vaidhi Bhakti or Sadhana Bhakti in the Vaidhi stage under the direction of a devotee who has affection, loving affection to Krishna can lead us to that access to pure love of Godhead. Otherwise we may advance. We can see in today's verse, um, I'll read it because the last three days I was, I was told that we were going to try to discuss a little bit about the Dhammadarastakam and this verse today is number four. So it's a nice verse because it's related to today's Bhagavatam verse. Excuse me, sleep deprivation. Number four. Varam, oh, they were singing a song. Varam devo moksham no moksha vadingva no chanyam vineyam varesharatiha idam teva purnata gopala balam sada me manasya varastam kingam yai is there a more beautiful song than this in the whole universe? It's such a beautiful song. It takes one into this mood which we're all aspiring for. That mood which is not there in the we we try to get it in the material world, but it's just not there. O oh Lord, although you are able to give all benedictions. I do not pray to you for the boon of impersonal liberation, nor the highest liberation of eternal life in Vaikuntha, nor for any other boon. Usually this word here in the verse, nachanyam, any other, vineham, any other boon you can give, vareshad piha. We usually think it probably means elevation to the heavenly planets or a boon like Shobari Muni has gained. He's now gotten this opportunity to enjoy incredible material uplands. Everyone would just so envious of such a situation. If only I could, they might become interested in yoga if they could achieve this. And if if they, they heard that by practicing yoga you'll become free of all material attachment, people would probably not be so interested. But here we see in this prayer, a Satyavata, we see him praying, I have no desire for liberation, moksha. Don't desire it. What to speak of heavenly pleasures, having 50 wives, a beautiful young celestial body, beautiful women, beautiful facilities. Forget it all. It's just like stool for one who has transcendental vision. Not interested. That's a pretty, pretty high test. Not even interested in even the perfection of moksha vadingva, even going to Vaikuntha. Not even interested in that. And not any other, no other boon which you may be able to bestow. Not interested in anything, my Lord. Nothing which may be obtained. And in the translation here, you don't always see it. But this is a translation given by Sanatana Goswami in his commentary on this song. He says, which may be obtained by executing the nine processes of bhakti. Now that's pretty interesting. He doesn't even aspire for whatever results or boons may come from executing the nine processes of bhakti. Especially in Vaidhi Bhakti, because Vaidhi Bhakti will, at best, will lead us to reverential perfection in Vaikuntha, maybe Dwarka or Yodhya, but not to Goloka. That's something else. 
even on the path of devotional service, to enter into perfection. We hear from Ramananda Roy and Lord Chaitanya's conversation, which goes way beyond material conception, even beyond the conception of liberation. It is not, a, it's not such an easy thing. It's by mercy. In this pastime of Mother Yasoda, Damodar pastime, we heard yesterday a little bit from Prahlad Nanda Maharaj, who I think it was, or maybe it was Jayad Veda Maharaj, I can't remember. Someone said how Mother Yasoda tried everything she could to tie Krishna with ropes, but they were always two fingers too short. She couldn't tie him. Those two fingers represent our endeavor or our sadhana. We can try our best and that may evoke Krishna's mercy or Radha's mercy. But the other one is the mercy. Without the mercy of the Lord, we cannot achieve that perfection. Even the yogic powers of Sobhari Muni ultimately are the mercy of Krishna. Everything depends on his mercy. This is one of the symptoms of one who is a surrendered soul. They completely depend upon Krishna's mercy, not upon our power. We may have a little bit of karmic independence, so to speak, whereby we seem to be achieving some material opulence or material position. But even that depends wholly and solely on the mercy of Krishna. Prabhupada writes in one purport, he says, the awakening of our dormant love of God does not depend at all upon our mechanical process of hearing and chanting but depends wholly and solely upon the mercy of Krishna. So that missing link is that mercy. Even the process of hearing and chanting, even become expert, may evoke that mercy and take us to the, to the threshold of love of Godhead. But it's the mercy of the Lord and his devotees which gives us that access. And that's what he's hankering after here in this verse. He says, O oh Lord, I simply wish that this form of yours as Balagopal in Vrindavan may ever be manifest in my heart. For what use to me are any other boon besides this? They are no use. They're all temporary or short of the mark, at least in his case. Of course, the devotees in the mood of Aishwarya Bhav, Vaikuntha, Dwarka, these realms are maybe fully satisfied, but not to such a Vatamuni. He, he just wants to be absorbed, he just wants to see that beautiful form of Krishna. Presumably he's in Vatsalya Bhav. He completely absorbed in that form of Krishna as a small boy, tied up by the ropes of Mother Yasoda. Prabhupada writes in one purport in the Shima, in the Bhagavad Gita, Manmana Bhava Man Bhakto Madhyaji Mamaskuru, that we should fix our consciousness on the form of Krishna. In this case, of course, we're hearing Bhagavad Gita. He said, the form who is standing before Arjuna, a beautiful two-armed form of Krishna. He wasn't playing his flute on the battle of Kurukshetra, but Prabhupada indicates that that form of Krishna, whether two-armed form or the form in front of Arjuna, are not on any other form of Godhead, although they may be, in one sense, transcendentally non-different, but they have a different mood. The, the, the highest perfection is in the conversation between Ramananda Roya and Lord Chaitanya is not to attain even to Dwarka, it's not even to attain different rasas, it's the highest taste, the highest form of devotional service, which can be accessible only in Vrindavan, only in the association of the associates of the Lord, who appear in this world very kindly as Śrīla Prabhupāda has appeared to give us this opportunity, although we, I, for, I can speak for myself, no eligibility, very attached still to this material world. As Śrīla Prabhupāda is kindly giving us this opportunity to perform this very special form of yoga. And by, if we stick to Śrīla Prabhupāda's lotus feet, we'll be safe. The yoga of which we are practicing is one of trying to satisfy Krishna through engaging our senses in varieties of devotional activities under the direction of an eternal associate of Vrindavan, who appears in this world in the Sadaka Rupa form 
in order to show us how to perform those activities of devotional service, specifically the act of spreading Krishna consciousness all over the world. Because people are in such ignorance. We were hearing yesterday one lecture, Srila Prabhupada was feeling so, he was er earnestly encouraging the devotees to preach because the suffering, said, it's unbearable to see the suffering of countless living entities in this world who think that the goal of life is material sense gratification. They advertise it, they put pictures of people in their 70s looking like teenagers, women, you know, 55 years old, it's a big thing, you know, with their dyed hair and their makeup and their plastic surgery all over and everything who look like young, fresh, young damsels. And this is, you know, something that people, I don't know how much the pharmaceutical business invests in it, but it's huge. It's a big seller. Such a waste of this human life. And Prabhupada was so sad to see this. There's no question of people thinking about Vanaprastha. Practically, they only go there to enjoy sex life. <coughs> now, this is Prabhupada's <coughs> great lamentation, the great suffering of pure devotees is to see this illusion that people are in. And the Bhagavad Bhagavatam is full of various incidents where whether it's Indra or Sobari Muni or Bharat Maharaj, whoever it may be, who show us the dangers of this material world and what to do when those dangers occur. So Bari Maharaj is teaching us here also. Eventually, let go. Go to the forest and again, take up that spiritual practice, at least in old age, to take it seriously. But it's better we not wait till old age when, you know, we can't remember things, we can't breathe or eat properly, sometimes our eyesight is fading, when Vidura was preaching to Dhritarashtra, trying to wake him up, your teeth are loose, your eyes are fading, you can hardly hear, your hairs are growing grey, your crinkles are everywhere, and still you think you can enjoy madness. Who was that? Was it Akbar? Who sent, asked his minister when in old age will this desire to enjoy diminish? Was it Akbar? Who was it? It was Akbar. And his minister said, my lord, even at the verge of death, it doesn't go away. He couldn't believe it. That, that's ridiculous. He said, I'll show you one day. So one day he told the king, bring your beautiful young daughter with me, please. I, I want to show you something very important. So as he did, the king came with his beautiful young daughter and they entered into the house of a dying man who was surrounded by his own family members, by the doctor, by the minister, by loving friends, all trying to console him. And when the young beautiful girl entered the room, the man's eyes suddenly focused on the young girl and with that wonderful vision of a young girl before his eyes he left his body perfection of life <laughs> as is described in the first chapter of the second canto there we find that um, in the beginning of that chapter Sukadeva Goswami tells Prakshit Maharaj right the goal of life what we should be thinking of at the time of death and it's not a beautiful young girl. What should we be thinking of at the time of death? Ante Narayana Smitihi, Krishna. We have to practice, human life is meant as a practice for death but people don't know about it. They try to avoid the issue. We, it's a wonderful, uh, uh, still a pastime isn't it? And I, I was told it took place in Kamyavan area when the Pandavas were exiled. And the last period of their exile, where, when they were in the forest, 
they had a severe test when that brahmana came to them oh please he was very sad one deer had come along and stolen away his paraphernalia for worship his shrub and his shruck and this this and that, that all stolen he came to the pandavas please can you help us of course upright kshatriyas of course we can we will protect you and they don't, never have we failed in protecting a brahmana so off they went to try to recover the paraphernalia of the brahmin they chased the deer into the forest but they couldn't get in he was somehow an elusive deer and eventually he disappeared into the forest they chased and chased and got lost in the forest then Yudhisthira thought Whew, what is going on we have never failed before something funny happening here and they were very thirsty all by the arrangement of the Lord this was going on so he said to his youngest brother Nakula please to go up into the tree and see if you can find by looking from a high tree a body of water we're thirsty so Nakula went up and he saw at a distance one body of water it looked very nice so he came down and Yudhisthira asked him to go and see if he could bring some water so he went off to bring water he found the lake beautiful lake something like the description of Sobari Muni's palace with these beautiful lakes to bathe in Whew. it's a dream situation a heavenly situation he got there it looked irresistible at first he wanted to slake his own thirst so he looked at the water very beautiful clear waters with lotus flowers and beautiful birds and trees all around the material wood can look quite attractive sometimes we get captivated by various factors even now we have all kinds of technology to captivate our attention different varieties of sense enjoyments are there different tastes yeah. living in the material world proper described in Mayapur in 76 and 77 he was talking on Pallad Maharaj's prayers every morning in the Bhagavatam and there's that wonderful verse there how you know made in the material world with our senses is like having many wives who are always dragging us it's like Sobari was dragged by this wife and then that wife he was never peaceful our senses make sure we're never peaceful one cools down and the other one hots up the eyes the nose the tongue the touch everything always pushing us especially the tongue so it's less like that a man with many wives all pulling on his limbs come here come here that was going on and on we're slaves to our senses and the sense objects so anyway a voice suddenly appeared at that lake stop this is my lake you cannot drink the water of this lake unless you answer my questions Nikula didn't heed the warning he drank the water and fell dead same thing so a little while later Sahadev came Yudhisthira sent him after an hour or two same thing then next Arjuna with his infallible Gandiva went to the lake and the voice came again Arjuna O heroic warrior be warned do not drink this water this lake belongs to me you cannot touch this water without my permission who are you where are you I cannot see you show yourself Arjuna shot many arrows into the sky but nothing worked the arrows simply fell to the ground Arjuna took the water and fell dead next was Bhima the most powerful who was thought nothing to worry about he went to the lake same thing he didn't heed the warning and he fell dead Yudhisthira was alone and wondered what has happened my brothers are, are infallible how could they have been killed is it some Asura or some Yaksha has Duryodhana joined up with some Yakshas whatever 
How has this happened? What's going on? He was afraid. Or have they become attracted by some apsaras on the banks of that lake? No, no. My brothers would not forego their, their, their duty, forego their duty. Yudhisthira went to the lake himself. Seeing the lake, he entered into the lake. Seeing his brothers lying there, looking dead. He entered the lake. Who has done this? Which powerful being? He entered the lake and the voice came again. Stop, O oh noble king. Do not drink the waters of this lake. Without my permission, you will die. Who are you? I'm a bird sitting here on this lake, living off the various plants around the lake. Eudicea looked up and saw a bird sitting on the branch. Yes, if you want to drink this water, you have to answer my questions. You are not a bird. How could a bird have killed my brothers? Who are you? I am a yaksha. He revealed his yaksha form. And if you do not answer my questions, you will also die. And he asked many questions. One by one, you just dare answer them perfectly about the goal of life, how we can attain it, what is the purpose? Then he came to various questions and the two primary ones. What is the most amazing thing in this world? And Yudhisthira Maharaj answered, the most amazing thing in this world is that all around us, as we heard earlier, although sufficiently experienced, we don't inquire into the real problems of life. Although all around us we see people dying, we think it will never happen to me. I will be infallible. The doctors, somehow or another, they'll invent some drug. Or maybe I'll go into deep freeze. Or whatever it is, we don't want to die. We don't want to die. They advertise, that's an advertisement, old age is unnatural. Well, it is in one sense, but it's not in the material world. It's part, of the, it's part of, the, of, the, of the game. You can't avoid it unless you die early. It's part of the game and it has an important part to play. That is to warn us that death is coming. We should wake up. When we find our teeth falling out and our eyes failing and all these symptoms, it's a great impetus to become serious about spiritual life and stop trying to make plans to enjoy this world. Plans to try to, you know, live longer. It's time to fully absorb ourselves in hearing and chanting about Krishna. Let go of all the various temporary attachments which we may have developed. It's a great, it can be a great impetus in old age for devotees and for people in general, it should be. But it's not. So he said, very nice. The Yaksha said, you are correct. This is the greatest in all the universe, the most amazing thing is not a woman, as one famous Bengali poet said, that a woman is the most amazing thing in the universe. Famous poet. Then he asked the question, and what, are the, what is the news of the world? News of the world was a newspaper in England. It is not, that's another thing. It was a Sunday newspaper, which was full of lewd, lewd pictures and mundane events. But that wasn't his answer. His answer was, the tidings of the world are like this. The world is like a witch's cauldron, a pot. The witch puts all kinds of nice things in the pot. You know, lizards, you know, frog's legs, wizard, lizards, all kinds of nice things. He said, the world is like a, a witch's cauldron. And the sun is like the fire. And the days and nights are the fuel. And the seasons are like the, the stirring, the stirring, the, the, the spoons, the ladles. That's the material world. Nice. And the living entities are the ingredients of the pot. 
and they are being cooked alive by time. But we don't realize it. Time is cooking us. Ayuhariti Vaipung San is taking away our very life at every rising and setting of the sun, except for those who take shelter of hearing and chanting the pastimes of the Lord. This is the only real relief from the miseries of this material world, this opportunity to associate here in Vrindavan or wherever Srila Prabhupada has taken Vrindavan to hear and chant in the association of devotees so we realize the purpose of this human form of life. And when time of death comes, we're not thinking and dreaming of all of our frustrated or unfulfilled desires which come before us. The time of death, they may come earlier in some cases. You see them. People like to live their lives. There was a pro television program when I was young Life begins at 80. <laughs> and they would bring people on the, on the stage, unknowing. They were, they were completely taken by surprise. And all of their childhood friends and all of their pastimes would be shown on a mega screen in front of them, or physically, if they were still alive. And they would all be talking about their wonderful experiences in this life, just to help them, so that they can make sure they take birth again in the material world and suffer. This is the illusion which we Sriman Bhagavatam Ki Jai Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai Hare Krishna Any questions or comments? Yes Prabhu I can't still answer but some of our illustrious Vaishnavas and Vaishnavas here may be to help Yes. Madam, you were speaking about Krishna, he was having 16,108. Pardon? 16,108. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, this is the first time in Yeah, we're not supposed to mention it in Vrindavan, I'm sorry about that. So, in Vrindavan also, he was there, he took the garments of the gopis, they wanted to have Krishna as their husband. So, when you say something about that, what is the difference between Dwarka and Vrindavan? What is the difference? The difference between uh, Dwarka What is the difference? They wanted Krishna as their husband. What is the difference between Dwarka? Well, Dwarka is on the ocean, Vrindavan is on the Yamuna. <laughs> different mood, huh? A different mood. Dwarka is tinged with a little bit of this Aishwarya Bhav, their wives. And a wife naturally has some, maybe traditionally at least, there is some kind of, you know, rules and regulations involved there. Um, and that's accepted in society in general as being acceptable. But in Vrindavan, uh, it just goes way beyond that. What can I say? I have no qualification to answer such a same question as that but we understand from whatever tiny little understanding we have is that here in Vrindavan uh, the, the loving reciprocation between Krishna and all of his devotees is not tinged as this particular song which we sing Dhammadarashtam is not tinged by any awe and reverence whatsoever it is completely free of any such inhibitions whatsoever Absolutely. Everyone in, everything and everyone in Vrindavan exists simply for the pleasure of Krishna. And Krishna exists simply for the pleasure of everyone and everything in Vrindavan. The colors, the clothing, the appearance, the, the sounds, everything is simply uh, to fulfill the desire of Krishna. And Krishna's desire is to, is, his life is simply to fulfill the desire of his devotees. So whatever happens here in Vrindavan is the highest uh, realm of pleasure. Nadini Shakti, um, the potency of Srimati Radharani, is the full presence here in Vrindavan. In other realms, partially present, but here in full. 
without any other interference, complete, absolutely complete. And for those who are on the material plane, even those in the reverential plane, this level of, or this aspect of devotion may not be understood. Just like we were reading yesterday in Radhakund, anyone who has any reverential tinge in their devotional approach cannot enter into Radhakund. It's inaccessible. It's inaccessible. In fact, those who have any material perspective, anyone who has any material desire, any identification with the material body, cannot even see Radhakund. Or the speaker take a bath in Radhakund. It is in inaccessible to eyes unless they are completely tinged with pure love of God, without any influence of, you know, I'm a wife, I'm this, I'm that. That's why some of the, in the Boma Vrindavan, some of the, some of the gopis, some of the wives of the gopas couldn't enter into the rasa dance because they still had a little idea or thought that I am the wife of so and so. They were prevented, they became purified, gave up that conception. It's not an easy thing. Only by the mercy of pure devotees can we enter into this realm. The mercy of Radharani, her Ladini Shakti, bestows upon us. It's not a cheap thing. And to try to discuss such topics as the one you've mentioned um, in our in my conditioned state is we only understand that this is simply bringing unending pleasure to all the residents, all the real pure devotees of the Lord. There is not a tinge of lust of the material sense. It's just pure love, Kama Rupa, in its complete perfection. To fulfill the desires of all of those young gopis who were praying to have Krishna as their husband. So he fulfilled all of their desires. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare, Shri Rohar Gijai.